All right, that should be a little bit better. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, family, and welcome to Kingdom Praise Ministries and Fellowship Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, August the 8th, 2021. Our lesson today is entitled, A Necessary Faith. And our devotional reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40. The background scriptures are Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 13, verses 1 through 19. The lesson today comes from chapter 11 of Hebrews, verses 1 through 8 and 13 through 16. We're still in the theme of comfort and hope, and we're in unit three, faith gives us hope. Now, as an introduction, I want you to think about how you felt when you were young, or even now, when your birthday approached. You were, you were excited and anxious. You knew you would certainly receive gifts and other special treats, but some things would be a surprise. Birthday combines assurance and anticipation. And so does faith. Faith is the conviction based on past experience that God's new and fresh surprises will surely be yours. The role models in this week's lessons were not perfect people, but pleasing God was utmost in their minds. They had faith in God and were obedient to his call. Their focus was on the future life and eternal truths. Now, since this is, since this is the first Sunday that we're in the book of Hebrews because the last few Sundays we were in Romans. I'm just going to give a brief introduction of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, it's actually a letter which was written to the Christians who may have been considering a return to dualism, perhaps because of immaturity or stemming from lack of understanding of biblical truths. And it's also written to all believers in Christ. The writer does not name himself and we don't know when it was written, we're assuming, and or who it was originally written to. But it's believed that the letter was written before the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome, which was 70 AD, since Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 indicates that the temple was still standing when the book was written. Its authorship has been debated since post-apostolic days. And in certain places, the language is like Paul's, and because of the personal reference to Timothy in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 23, some scholars have attributed the letter to Paul, although there is no conclusive proof that he is the author. However, it seems that most likely the author of Hebrews was a Jew himself, since he knew about the tendencies of the Jewish readers to focus on works. The writer's purpose was to demonstrate the superiority of Christ in his persons over all human beings and angelic beings and the superiority of his work and sacrificial ministry to the Mosaic priestly system. The writer encouraged Jewish Christians to be faithful when they might otherwise have fallen away from the faith because of persecution. Hence the readers are exhorted to hold fast as in Hebrews chapter three, verse six, and to go on unto perfection, Hebrews chapter six, verse one. The writer commends some readers for living by faith in Jesus as the Messiah despite persecution by exhorting them to preserve or persevere in faith. Our lesson comes from chapter 11 and is broken down to three parts. The meaning of faith, which is verses one to three, examples of faith, verses four to eight, and the goal of faith, verses 13 to 16. All right, chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. After declaring the just shall live by faith in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, the writer of Hebrews begins chapter 11 by emphasizing that faith is the basis of one's hope to receive the internal promises of God. He gives the definition of or the description of race of faith in two parts. First, he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The basic meaning of substance is something that is put under something else to support it. The word is used for a strong base or foundation 
that will firmly hold what is put on it so that one can have complete assurance in what it holds up. Faith is to a Christian what a foundation is to a house. It gives confidence and assurance that it will stand. So you may say, faith is the confidence of things hoped for. When a believer has faith, it is God's way of giving him confidence and assurance that what is promised will be experienced. Faith then is the foundation for future hopes. It gives certainty that what God has promised is real and will be fulfilled, even though we may have we may not experience it yet. And you can see that in First Peter chapter one, verses seventy nine, and Hebrews also mentions that he, um, chapter eleven, verses seven through eight. Things hoped for are things or promises expected or looked for. In other words, there is no doubt that they will be received. Biblical faith is complete confidence, and there is no question that God will keep his promises in his word. Faith and hope go together, and the same things that are the object of our hope are the object of our faith. Faith is a firm expectation that God will perform all that he has promised to us in Jesus Christ. The writer also says that faith is also the evidence of things not seen. The term evidence can mean proof, but it can also mean confirmation, verification, affirmation, or authentication. Just as faith gives assurance of things that has not happened, it also gives proof that things that cannot see are real. For the time being, only faith can see the future as it receives the promises of God. Since we can't see it or physically feel faith, some people claim that faith is not real. But the writer uses two words, substance and faith, to refute such an idea. Both of these words describe something that is real. Substance is normally used to describe something that can be seen and felt and evidence is a proof that something is real. Two other words to describe faith is sure and certain. These two qualities need, need a secure beginning and ending. The beginning point of faith is believing in God's character. He is who he says. The end point is believing in God's promises. He will fulfill his promises even though we don't see those promises materializing yet. We can demonstrate true faith. Verse two, for by it, the elders attain a good report. Now we're talking about the faith of the elders. This means that because of their faith, the elders or the Hebrews ancestors receive a good report, which literally means they were witness concerning them. The word elders here refers to those men and women who are faithful to God before the old covenant and those who were faithful to God after the law are mentioned in this chapter. A good report means divine approval. The Lord who reads the heart looks favorably upon the faithful elders. The good report that the elders received was God's declaration that they were righteous by faith, as it is explicitly stated regarding Abel and Enoch, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Verse three, through faith, we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now the writer here tells us that faith causes a believer to understand, that is to think logically, being able to tell the difference between true and false. So through or because of faith, we, our believers, understand that the world was framed by the word of God. The term world here really refers to the entire universe. And I'm just telling that to those, the newcomers. Although no human witnessed the creation, we know from scripture that God brought universe into existence through his word. The Greek word in the expression, the word of God, refers to the spoken word. The universe came into existence as God spoke to man in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 to 19. The phase, the worlds were framed by the word of God, reveals the creation of the universe, did not come out of matter something that already existed but out of nothing god declared that it would be and it was and you know we serve an awesome god 
by faith, we understand much more about the foundations or the formations of the world or the universe than we ever could understand with the naked eye or the human reasoning. The universe, which includes the earth, are not always here, nor did they produce themselves, but they were made by God himself. He is the maker of all things, and whoever is the maker of all things must be God. The writer also says that the world was framed meaning that God made the universe with such great exactness, each part would work in harmony. Through his word, by his essential wisdom and eternal son, and by his act of will saying, let it be done, and it was done. And you can see that in Psalms chapter 33, verse 9. And there's a general principle that's accepted by many that says, out of nothing, nothing can be made. This may be true of human creative power but it's not true with God because he called those things which be not as those they were. That's Romans chapter four, verse 17 and commands them into being. We understand these things through or because of our faith. The Bible gives us the truest and the most exact account of the origin of all things. And we ought to believe it. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So our first example or model given of someone who received a good report or divine commendation as a righteous person who lived by faith is Abel. Abel is the first of the 18 biblical figures cited in the the book of um, Hebrews chapter 11. Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's first two sons. Cain was the eldest, and he was a farmer. Abel was a shepherd, and of course he was the youngest, and offered a sacrifice to please God, while Cain's sacrifice was unacceptable. Abel's sacrifice, which was an animal substitute, was more acceptable to God. Scripture does not elaborate why Cain's offering was unacceptable, but it's believed that God gave instructions as to what was acceptable as a sacrifice, and Cain didn't follow it. Offerings of the firstborn animals were superior to offerings of vegetables and fruits. Remember, by the remission of, of sin requires the shedding of blood. It's also interesting that the Holy Spirit didn't inspire the writer to say anything about the faith of their parents, Adam and Eve. But the passage begins with Abel. He's considered one of the first saints and one of the first martyrs for religion for all of sons of Abel, Adam. Abel lived by faith and died for it. And therefore he was fit martyr for Hebrews to imitate. The writer says that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It appears that from the beginning, there has been a remarkable difference between worshipers. Here there's two brothers, both of them intended to worship God, and yet there's a vast difference. It was because of God's grace which makes the men truly honorable. Since Abel presented a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, he attained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift. That means that God was a witness to the fact that Abel was righteous or in right standing with him. God also testified to, to this when he accepted Abel's gift. As a result of Abel's faith, God had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And you can see that in Genesis 4.4. The last part of this verse says, by Abel's faith, he being dead, yet speaketh. In other words, although Abel is dead, he still speaks to believers through his act of faith. Like many before and after him, Abel is dead, but he speaks as one of the cloud of witnesses, which is a figure of speech that refers to the heroes of faith that's presented in this chapter. Now, before we go on, um, I think it's necessary to identify the cloud of witnesses just mentioned. And I'm not gonna cover them all because there's so many you need to get in the book and read. And actually they're not all in chapter 11, um, but it's throughout the Bible. They are the saints, this cloud of witness, they are the saints who have come before us and have successfully finished their course of faith. They are now witnesses speaking to us and encouraging us to also run successful races by faith. 
They are witnesses to the kind of faith that God requires of all believers. And we should be inspired by what they have accomplished for the Lord. These witnesses include Enoch, Abraham, and Sarah, which was discussed, Moses, David, Rahab, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Gideon, Samson, Barak, Samuel, the prophets, and so many more. And you may have some people in your lives that exhibit great faith. That may be, that's a good example. But these people who faith conquer kingdoms, they administer justice. They gain what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, they quench the firing of the flames, and they escaped the edge of the sword. Who weaknesses were turned into strength, who became powerful leaders in battles and routed foreign armies. And you can see that description in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. Verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God has translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And this is a second model of faith. The writer mentions translated, which means he did not see death. And it just simply means he was taken away. Just like um, the New Testament says, caught up. The writer also says that Enoch was not found because God had translated him. Genesis 5, 24 says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, but God took him. God took him body and soul into heaven, just like Jesus will do the saints when he comes back for his second coming. Be ready. Then we are told that the reason why God translated or took Enoch from the earth so that he would not see or succumb to death was because before his translation, he has this testimony that he pleased God. How did Enoch please God? Enoch walked with God. And we can see that in Genesis 5, 22 and verse 24. This means that he had a continuous fellowship with the Lord. Genesis 5, 22 and 23 tells us that he walked with God for 300 years, nearly all of his life, because Nina lived to, to 365 years. So for the bulk of his life, he walked with God. And I consider that amazing, considering the fact that most of us Christians, you know, he's there continuously. But how many of us have a hard time focusing on God in our relationship when we're studying? How many times do your mind drift off? I know mine's do. Those who by faith walk with God remaining in continuous fellowship with them in a simple world are pleasing to him. And he will show them his favor and put honor upon them. Something I want you to meditate on during the week is again, ain't it walk with God. And I want you to think of three words to describe you and your relationship with the Lord. Okay. Verse six, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. After giving these two models of faith and before giving more examples to author, pause here and he states a real important principle. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. What our lesson says, faith is necessary. Ain't it please God? which was evidence of his faith, for without faith, no one can please God. But this faith must be more than a positive feeling about life. It must be trust in God. Two essential elements of faith are then provided. First, he that cometh to God must believe that he is or that he exists. This must be a sound elementary it may sound elementary, but many people fail to come to God because they don't believe that there is a God. The truth is that we can't have faith in something or someone that we don't believe exists. Second, we must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To diligently seek God implies an earnest search, not a half-hearted attempt to know him. We must see him as the author of our moral order in which he always fulfill his promises. Knowing God begins with being convinced that he exists. This confidence leads the believer to diligently seek him, to have his or her needs met. 
God rewards the faith of those who earnestly and wholeheartedly seek him out. Those who seek the Lord with all their heart and all their soul will find him. Deuteronomy 4, chapter 29. And once they have found him and they are reconciled to God, they will never regret the time they spent seeking after him, for the rewards are great. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an altar to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became there, became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. After declaring that it's impossible to please God without faith, the writer gives us another example, which is Noah. Now, Noah received a warning from God about things that had not been seen by man up to that point. A flood would come upon the earth. Undoubtedly, Noah had divine revelation, or whether it may be God's voice or vision, we are not told. But it must have been a revelation that carried out its own existence because Noah's evidence was he stopped preparing an ark to the saving of his house. He was forewarned about the great and severe judgment such as the world had never seen up to that time in history, and not even the smallest sign of a coming flood was given. The words moved with fear means that Noah was devout and reverence in his relationship with God. So he willingly obeyed God and built an ark that would save him and his household. And the whole world of sinners were perishing around Noah as he preached God's message of the judgment. God offered grace to the world 120 years before he sent the judgment of the flood, but many didn't receive it. The phrase condemn the world means that no example of man's faith before the unre unrepentant sinners condemned them. The truth is that good examples will either convert the sinner or condemn them. The best way the people of God can condemn the wicked is not by harsh or vile language, but by a holy exemplary lifestyle. It was only by faith that Noah became heir of the righteousness. He possessed a true justifying righteousness because by faith, he was an heir to it. An heir is someone who received an inheritance. The Lord reward Noah's faith by clothing him in his righteousness. His obedience to God's revelation showed that he was a man of faith. All the faith see things that are invisible because they transcend the physical universe as we see in Hebrew 3. Here the emphasis is on faith concerning things that are still future yet are certain because God has promised them. The coming flood of judgment was not yet visible when God's word came to Noah. He built an ark in reverence response to God's warning and through his act of faith, his family received salvation. The unbelieving world was condemned and Noah inherited the righteousness that comes by faith. During the 120 years of drought, Noah experienced rejection because he was different from his neighbors. Think of this. God commanded him to build a huge boat in the middle of dry land. And although God's command seemed foolish, Noah obeyed it. Noah's obedience made him appear strange to his neighbors, just as new beliefs of Jewish Christianity Christians undoubtedly made them stand out. As you obey God, don't be surprised if others regard you as different. Your obedience make their disobedience stand out. Remember, if God asks you to do something, he will give you the necessary strength to carry out that task. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he went, whether he went. The next model of faith in this text, again, is Abraham. Abraham was called to go someplace that he didn't know where he was going. He was living with his family in Haran, and after traveling 450 miles with his father from Ur, Ur to Chaldeas to Haran, then while he was there, God called him to go to another land. Now, how many of us would be obedient like Abraham to go someplace that we don't know where we're going? but Abraham did so. Abraham is a great example of someone who put himself into the hands of God to send him wherever he wanted to. Abraham submitted to God's wisdom to lead him 
and submitted to his will, believing that God knew best about everything that concerned him. Those who are effectually caught by God must give up their own will and wisdom to the will and wisdom of God. And it is wise for them to do so. Although they may not always know where God is leading them, they do know that they're guides and this satisfy them. God is our guide. The writer also said that eventually the land that God will lead Abraham and his family to, he will receive it for an inheritance. After Abraham's father died, God called Abraham again while he was in Haran and sent him to Canaan. After receiving confirmation from God that the land of Canaan would be given to him for an inheritance, Abraham followed God. He continued. Now verses 9 through 12 is not part of our printed text, but those verses include more discussion about the faith of Abraham and Sir and several other models of faith. So when you get an opportunity, please go back and read those scriptures. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims in the land. And the writer draws a conclusion concerning the patriarchs, particularly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when he said, these all died in faith. Although Isaac and Jacob, which was not mentioned at this point, but they come up in verses 20 and 21, God's plan included them, but the ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant was still in the future. The phase, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, mean that the patriarchs still had faith when they died, even though they had not received or experienced a tangible fulfillment of God's promises found in the Abrahamic covenant, as well as the promise of the Messiah. However, Although the patriarchs didn't experience the promises of the covenant themselves, that faith allowed them to see or believe that the promises would be fulfilled afar off or in the future. That faith also persuaded or convinced them that the promises of God will come to pass as a result. The patriarchs also embraced or welcomed them. Faith has a long arm. It can be embraced or lay hold to God's promises from a great distance away or lay hold to God's promises in the great distance, as is, or the present. The last part of this verse says that the patriots also confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This means that the patriots, knowing that they would not immediately receive God's promises, admitted or confess that while on earth they live as strangers and pilgrims, seeing the present life is only temporary. They confess, admitted that their true homeland is heavenly not earthly, and future, not present. It is said of Abraham that he looked beyond Canaan to a lasting heavenly country and city designed and built by God himself. Just like us, the patriarchs would enter into the true homeland, which is heavenly, not earthly, and future, not present. All believers are heirs of salvation and are homeless refugees on earth. Because until Jesus return, Believers are in exiles from the home we are waiting to inherit. Verse 14. For they say in such things, declare plainly, they are seek a country. They're just saying that they refer to anyone, but particularly a patriarch who spoke about being strangers in Canaan. So the writer is just saying that those who confess they are strangers here declare are seeking their homely home in heaven. Verse 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have the opportunity to return. If they truly miss Haran or Canaan, they have the opportunity to go back. But I want you to think about this on the spiritual lesson. Those who were once eventually called out of a sinful state to have no desire to return back to it because by faith, they know that we have a better things ahead. So you leave in that old lifestyle and you should be worshiping God in his new lifestyle style, under the new covenant. And our final verse, verse 16, but now they that desire a better country, that is, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Instead of being comfortable in their earthly home, they, the patriots, desire a better country that is a heavenly home. 
The term desire means to stretch out or grasp something. The heavenly country is better than any country on earth. It is better situated, better stored with everything that's good, and better secured from everything that's evil. The enjoyments, the society, and everything in it are better than the best of this world have to offer. Therefore, all believers desire this better country. Well, we all should be desiring a better country. The faith of the patriarchs and a better country led to their obedience to God. Therefore, for that reason, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared the city for them. This is the rewards for their faith and our faith. God is the God of all true believers, and faith gives us a share in him and in his fullness. He is called their God. He declared, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And because of their faith and our faith in him, God is not ashamed for them or for us to call him our God. The Lord also gave us the spirit of adoption, which enabled us to cry, Abba, Father. And you can see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. And if this is not enough, God had prepared for us and for them a city. As a result, no saint should feel at home here on earth because this is not our home. We are strangers just passing through. Our home is in heaven with Jesus. And be ready because if we don't go before the rapture, we will be caught up with him. In conclusion, God's honor roll of faith fills Hebrews chapter 11. The people who filled it came from all walks of life and all kinds of cultural perspectives. Some was rich, others were poor, but faith with God of the Bible was a link between them all. They are examples to us of faithfulness to God. Although our lessons report that these godly people died and haven't received the promises, it does not mean that the promises were not spoken to them. It does mean that they didn't experience the realization of the divine promises. They died anticipating them but their hopes were not in vain because they are necessary faith to believe in the word of God and still proves to be true for them in the ages to come, just like for us. Something I want you to take away, if nothing else, true Bible faith is competent obedience to God's will in spite of circumstances and consequences. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust his word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are or what the consequences may be. The circumstances might be impossible and the consequences frightening and unknown, but we obey God's word just the same and believe in him to do what's right and what's best for us. Remember, we must do more than believe in God. We must believe God. It's a difference. That's my conclusion. Any questions, comments? You know, it's just nobody saying that this scripture is one of my favorite passages of scriptures. You you did an outstanding job, and I like what, how you really concluded that. This made me start clapping and rejoicing. You know, this difference in believing God and believing in God, and we must That's right. believe God. Wonderful, wonderful lesson. And as you was teaching the lesson in the beginning, you talked about uh, parts of the of this Hebrew chat book of Hebrews being uh, written by Paul. Maybe we look at some of the writings. And as you was teaching it, you know, even though I read this so many times, I could begin to see how people would say that, especially when we look at the examples of how Paul used the Old Testament saints to to bring them into what now is the New Testament and give those examples to show that there was no difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You right. see that Paulinic writing and, and that writing style. So uh, just so much here in this lesson, wonderful lesson. Uh, there was a couple of things, but I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to ponder them in my head. Uh, just so much. You did an excellent job in describing faith and, and, and hopefully people, uh, uh, got uh, something out in the beginning you gave three examples you said that uh, the meaning of faith and I didn't get to write down the other two in the beginning uh, how you broke down Hebrews 11. Okay do you want me to repeat them or send them to you? Either or or both. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the presentation. Uh, this 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 is excellent I just 
thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and I like the way, you know, you just broke this down. Um, and, and, and you also said that Abel was considered one of the first saints. Um, that's, you know, this just a wonderful, wonderful lesson. I thank you for it. Uh, I am truly blessed by it. As a matter of fact, I just told my wife uh, that, you know, this is what you need to go back in every look at. <laughs> Amen. And I look at them. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Even though you don't see my face up there, I am here. All right. I just wanted to make a comment about um, Enoch. And you said that Enoch lived for 365 years. And yes. 300 of those years, he walked with God. Yes. Our life expectancy has dropped since the Yes. <laughs> about 75. And Lord, we can hardly um, walk with God for 75 of those years. Mm -hmm. So we need to get ahead and start working harder here. I tell you. We'll never make that 300 years like Enoch, but we can do what we can do until God calls us home. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I thought that God. was a good point. Your lesson was wonderful. Thank you so much. Praise God. Uh, another thing that you said, you talked about the good report uh, being um, God's divine approval. I like that. And um, the other thing that you brought out in the lesson was that Enoch was taken up, you know, and, and I put a special note there that that taken up, you know, how you pointed out, and I'm glad you did, uh, is the same as when Christ comes back for us. It's the same as the translates. I, I thought that was an interesting note. Praise God. Um, you said you missed something on, on faith. You got substance and evidence, right? I got, I got um, point one. It says the meaning of faith. Okay. Yeah, I know at the very beginning you said there was three. How it was divided into three uh, verses. One through three was the meaning of faith, I think you said. Oh, okay. You're talking about how our lesson, the way our lesson's divided. Yes. Okay. Um, the meaning of faith, examples of faith, and the goal of faith. Examples. Mm -hmm. And four through eight talks about the various examples of faith. But if you go on and continue to read throughout the scripture, Hebrews 11 actually give us a lot of examples of faith. Yes. And, and what I like about that is that it tells us that that, that cloud of witnesses is not all encompasses. There's some more. That's that, right. And, and right. you point out that some of the people that we know might be included in that cloud of witnesses. That's right. All right, my brother JJ. How you knew I was coming? I know you was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know you was laying in wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say um, I like the way you explain it and everything, but this is one of the various difficult subjects in people's lives. You know, often God tests our faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, faith is a process. And that's why we got to go through each of our own little trials and tribulation to increase our faith. But this is, this is very difficult. And you have to... If you want to compare yourself to them brothers in, in the Old Testament, we'll come, we'll always fall short. We'll fall short, but keep in mind, we got a goal. And our goal is to be just like these examples. Amen. Oh, but, um, I just want people to know, you know, it's something faith is something you're gonna always have to work on. Yes, you do. Amen. You know, Brother Jay, I'm glad that Jesus said he gave to every man a measure of faith, you know, and as, as Sister Echoes was teaching, she said that the reason some people can't accept God, well, all people can't accept God is because their lack of faith. They haven't exercised the gift that God has given them. You know, we accept that God created the earth because the scriptures tell us, and by faith, we, you know, that's the proof of faith. It proves to us by God's word that he created the heavens and the earth. And those who lack faith will never see that. That's why they can't accept God because they lack 
faith. Or they just don't believe in God. Exactly. You know, and you have to believe in God. Yes. In order to exercise, you have to believe that God is who he says he is. And he That's has, right. is he's done and will do what he says he will do. And if you can't accept that, then you will lack faith or you won't be able to exercise your faith. Amen. Amen. And also in the Bible, you know, God give us a, a lot of promises. Mm -hmm. We have to believe that he will, that he will and have done so far kept all those promises. Yes, I agree. I like I like the young man in uh, in Mark nine, where he goes and asks to heal God, um, Jesus to heal his son. And then Jesus said, "Well, your faith will heal him." He said, "Well, please help me with my unbelief." Amen. Amen. And sometimes I get there. I know. Have you ever been there? Lord, I'm trusting you, but Lord, I need you to help me. You know, I tell you. Is there another? Okay, well, next week's lesson is called A Patient deserving faith and the devotional reading is psalms chapter 40 verses 1 to 13 the background scripture comes from hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 39 and it's going to be taught by minister and trainer michael eckles jr and it looked like reverend thornton is having a hard time connecting to audio yeah, it looks that way. <laughs> it's been connected to audio since he joined, so I guess uh, there might be his connection might be weak. Um, okay. So well, then I'm going to have Pastor Eccles close us out in prayer. Okay. Let's pray, Father. We are so grateful for this kind of lesson, reminding us that without faith, it is impossible please you. We come before you this morning, like the young man mentioned today, who said, Lord, I believe, but help our unbelief. Let us fill our hearts, O oh God, with your word, so we might be people of faith. We want to be like Enoch, mm -hmm. who walk with you continuously. Yes. Not. We know it's a tall call, but he was a man just like you, and just like anybody else. And we thank you for setting an example for us. Help us to be people of faith. Right now, we want to cast all this unbelief out of us. Yes. Situations in our lives that we are wondering whether we can make it, wondering whether you're really going to see us through, wondering whether the, the need will be met, wondering how things are going to work out. Help us to cast all our wondering aside. Because we've heard this morning that you called those things are not as though they were. We heard this morning that we must believe that you are and that you are rewarded of those who diligently seek you. And we come, oh God, to give you thanks for that. For just hearing the word of God has encouraged our faith this morning. Help yes. us to walk as faithful people, believing and trusting you for every situation. We commit our way to you this day. Yes, we thank you for allowing us to hear this precious word. And let us walk by this word we've heard this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen, Brother Fields. I see you and Brother Dixon on. God bless you, brothers. And God bless you. we will uh, see you all on next week. And uh, Brother Fields and Brother Dixon, I do have <clears throat> a book for you guys. I will be getting it to you uh, soon. So, uh, we Amen. You, um, period starts in September, so you should have them before then. Okay. God and bless you. Wonderful lesson. Wonderful. If there's anybody else who needs a Sunday school book, just let us know. We'll be sure that you get it.